Welcome to the OT. I am Elise Jesse, and we start off with a very impressive defensive stat. You've probably heard it already, but the Cincinnati Bengals have not allowed a touchdown in the second half all season long. They are the only team to do that in the National Football League. I was speaking with Jesse Bates this afternoon in the locker room, and I was just asking him why those second half adjustments land so well. They translate so well onto the field with this team. Um, and he just mentioned that Lou Anarumo, you know, makes his second half adjustments and he makes sure to communicate that well and concisely with the players because they don't have a lot of time at halftime before they have to come back out for the second half. Um, and he said, yeah, Lou Anarumo makes his adjustments and then he opens that conversation and makes it a broader conversation where the rest of the players also voice what they're noticing and what they are seeing that maybe nobody's picking up on for the second half. And that is where they have been so successful. He also mentioned that this team, yes, it's young, but it's also a very smart football team. You do not need to be a veteran to be a smart football player, and I think we're seeing that so far this season. I also asked the same question to Chidobe Obuzie. This is his answer. You know, honestly, when we, I guess, were made aware of the fact that kind of became something cool, yeah. um, we didn't really know, you know that was even a thing, but um, I think we take more pride in just responding to any situation that we're given. You know, um, we've been in a lot of situations where we had to finish the game. And uh, some of the situations we finished, some of the situations we didn't. So I think um, that stat is also giving us, you know, taking the pride that we are finishing in some way. So um, yeah, it's always about how you respond to what happens in the game. And, you know, we're able to do that in the first half. Um, things happen, and then the second half we respond the correct way. I know you guys only have a few minutes at halftime to make adjustments, but why does Lou Anarumo's message, his adjustments, why do they land so well with you guys? I couldn't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I really couldn't tell you. I just think that... Um, you know, it's like, because we come in with a game plan, and, you know, usually second half, we stay with that game plan. You know, it's just stuff that the players, us, we have to, um, you know, be critical of ourselves on how we could fix it. So I think it's more so of, you know, how we respond to, you know, the challenges that they're presenting us, you know, and then when they come in halftime and the coaches give us, you know, certain keys and cues, that's when we really, you know, start to look at ourselves like, okay, this is what we need to fix, and then we end up doing that, so. And I know that you typically cover the, the best receiver. Amari Cooper is Jacoby Brissett's <laughs> top target. Hey, Fred. Um, when you are out there and you know that quarterbacks have only completed 55% of their passes when they pass your way, um, what allows you to play lights out like that? I just, you know, try to be focused um, throughout the week in my preparation, um, film study. You know, I'm looking for anything that I can grab so that when I'm out there, I have at least a framework to work in. You know, if you go out there and just play without any knowledge of, you know, formation, splits, stems, and stuff like that, I probably wouldn't succeed very well. So credit to a lot of the coaches and credit to, you know, me trying to get prepared as well. And knowing, I mean, no, you're focused on pass defense, but knowing that Nick Chubb, the Browns are 0-5 when he gets 20 carries or less. How important is it for you guys to also make sure as a unit you stop that run? Oh, that's the biggest thing. You know, uh, we believe that Nick Chubb's the best running back in the NFL, and they're, that's obviously coupled to their whole team. You know, it takes a whole team to block for the guy. Uh, the coaches create a great run scheme, and we know that when it comes down to it, he's going to be getting the ball. And I remember last year there was a drive where – it was two minute and usually quarterback passes, but they handed the ball to Nick Chubb every play. So I, I definitely know that he's that guy for them, the closer and the beginner. So we'll have to get him on the ground early. And last question for you. The fact that this game is on Monday night, mm. does that impact your game day outfit? I know that you <laughs> typically like to go with mm. Nigerian mm. Um, fashion, mm. but do you dress up for Halloween at all? Nah, I'll, I'll, no. I'll, I'll keep it in the uh, I'll keep it in the family in the uh, Nigerian <laughs> traditional wear. Some somewhere around there. Yeah, okay. Somewhere around there. <laughs> I like it. Looks good every week. Yeah, yeah. Thank doing you. Doing well. I actually owe Chidobe Awuzie an apology because I slighted him so much. The quarterback rating is 55.6, but quarterbacks are only completing 40% of their passes when throwing in the direction of Chidobe Awuzie. Um, fantastic answers from him. And I will let you know that I talked to Sam Hubbard off camera and he mentioned that while everybody in the locker room has seemed to go towards the more classic um, dress up the gear that they like to wear on game day um, they are going to make those rookies dress up for Halloween on Sunday so look out for that that will be fantastic social media content I'm sure um, but I also talked with Jonah Williams and one of the biggest conversations within the locker room today was Nick Chubb and there's a big reason for that he's the best running back in the league let me read this off for you 
first in rushing yards, first in yards after contact, first in rushing touchdowns, first in missed tackles forced, and first in explosive runs with 24. Super talented, really strong, um, and they have a great running game. And I think that with that stat that you said, um, they're probably losing games when they're trying to play from behind and have to pass the ball a lot to try to get back in games. You know, they're, they're tough to stop when they're rolling and they're, um, you know, rushing as well as they typically do. Uh, so, you know, it's going to be a challenge for our defense, but they've been playing great. I know they're going to handle it. It seems like um, whatever, whoever you're facing in the AFC North specifically, it's almost like you have to throw the record out the window because AFC North teams always play each other incredibly tough. Mm -hmm. Is that the case here on Monday night? Yeah, I think that's the case going into every game in the league, but um, definitely in the division. Um, so we know it's going to be a battle. You know, Cleveland's a physical team. They're going to have a great fan base. It's going to be loud, and we have to handle all that and rise above it and get out of there with a win. What did you, how proud were you of um, Joe Burrow's play last game? It seems like you guys are getting into a groove. I mean, you guys are playing certainly with an edge on the offensive line. Is everything just kind of clicking right now? Yeah, I think the last couple of weeks we started clicking a little bit better, and that helps everyone, you know. It, it helps us play better and helps what we do work. It helps the receivers. It helps everyone. I feel like we're playing pretty good complimentary football as an offense. And the cool thing is that we know we can be even better. Um, so that's that's what that's why we're here practicing today, and that's where we're trying to get better every week. Favorite Halloween costume you've ever worn? If you did celebrate Halloween, uh, I was a caveman oh, one time. Oh, okay. Yeah. How old were you? Uh, I was probably like seven or eight. It's a good costume. It was a good costume, yeah. And uh, my dad made a club <laughs> out of like a wiffle ball bat and uh, great stuff and spray painted it brown. It's pretty cool. Um, yeah, I'd say that one. I, I remember that, that one. Out of I all love them, the homemade that's like, ones. Yeah. <laughs> I probably look like Fred Flintstone a little bit. <laughs> Wait, how? I'm trying to picture it. How tall were you when you were seven or eight? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Were you I was as big as a kid in my class. Okay, yeah, okay. I, so I was always the tallest kid in my class. <laughs> we'll keep so. it there. Are you going to dress up at all I'm on not. game day? No. Are you going to keep it like normal, classic I'm keeping game it day normal. attire? I don't know. Monday Night Football, game day. You're not really going to show up as like Texas yeah. Chainsaw Massacre theme or anything? I mean, I could be lying to you and then I'll just do it for the surprise, <laughs> but I'm, probably, I'm not really planning on it now. The Cleveland Browns offense is going to go through Nick Chubb. In fact, they are 0-5 when Nick Chubb gets 20 or less carries in a game. So it's certainly going to go through him. The Bengals' defense will need to play with their heads up, obviously, and make sure that they are able to stop the, that run. DJ Reader will not be there to help out. So they've got to continue their consistency as far as next man up is concerned. Um, in my next conversation, one of my favorites so far this year was with Steve Weish of NFL Network. Here's our conversation. Okay, if you are an avid listener or viewer of the OT, you know that I love having these conversations that I get excited about. I like to listen to certain people talk in the NFL um, and about this game. Um, and I like for you guys to be able to take some value from these conversations as well. And I think I have the perfect man for the job today. He is Steve Weish. He is NFL Network's chief national reporter. You can follow him on Instagram and Twitter at Weish89. Um, I, I follow you on both platforms and it's well worth the time to go and click the follow button. Steve, I want to talk to you about football, but we got to check in. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Elise. Thanks so much for having me on. You know, folks in Cincinnati are some of the few, few folks who can pronounce my last name right because <laughs> of Sam Weich, the yes. old coach. Um, but no, thanks for so much having me on. I, I'm excited to talk about a team that, you know, if people have been following me for months, I said I've been highly bullish on. I think they're going to make another Super Bowl run. And, uh, you know, mainly because I love number nine. I just, I just think he is a savage back there quarterback. You're absolutely right. And we can we can judge that by the numbers, especially last week where he was 34 for 42. 481 yards, three touchdowns. I mean, he seems like he is getting back into a rhythm, the rhythm that we saw Joe Burrow in last year. He really is. I mean, I think the whole offense is. Uh, but Burrow, look, the first two games were rough, yeah. um, I think, for the whole team. I think that was their, their kind of their first two preseason games. But then they steadily got it back, you know, against a Jets team that is now playing very good football. Yes. So, you know, look, the Falcons – 
you know, people say, okay, well, the Bengals are supposed to beat the Falcons. The Falcons have played a bunch of one-score games. I mean, they have been a tough out. And the way I watched Joe Burrow just absolutely dissect that defense was as, as I said earlier, savage and surgical as anyone I've seen. I mean, he he noticed they had some injuries in the secondary, and he went after them. The big plays, the intermediate plays, the way he stood in the pocket under pressure, the way he evaded pressure, the accuracy. I mean, the distribution of the ball. I mean, Hayden Hurst one play, Jamar Chase the next, T. Higgins the next, Tyler Boyd the next. They, I mean, they're, they're rolling right now. And, and I think they've got an opportunity over their next three or four games to continue this before I think they really hit the, 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 the fangs of their schedule, so to speak. Joe Burrow has just all of these weapons. He has three number one receivers. Um, and he's he seems like he's clicking. He's, he's figuring out what's working for them. At first, they had a little bit of trouble um, with the Tampa 2 defense and cover two. And now it seems like they are really figuring out how to get through that so far. It's almost like they don't care. <laughs> I mean, when, when, seriously, when you watch them play, when you watch them play, it's like our athletes – our receivers are better. Jamar Chase, Tyler Boyd, T- Hayden Hurst, they're, they're better than your guys. But he feels like he's more accurate as a deep ball thrower, yeah. as someone who can put the ball in a spot where only his guys can get it. I, just watching them, I mean, I paid a lot of attention to in the past two weeks, and they are playing like they just don't care. Like all the talent that they've assembled, you just talked about a receiver, getting Mixon and, and getting Pirine involved in, in the short mm-hmm. passing game. Like, there's like, we don't care. We are going to beat you. Our guys are better. Let's go for it. Throw, throw whatever you want at us. We got this. And, and that's what, that's how they were playing at the end of last season. Mm-hmm. It was, it was kind of like they were playing with house money. And right. they're a team with a target. And they're a team with a target on their back. They're not playing with house money. So that's why I think people should be so encouraged right now. And going, I know it's only week eight, but is Joe Burrow, should he be part of that MVP conversation in your opinion? And I want your yes. honest one. If not, it's yes. okay. <laughs> yes. He was my, he was my preseason pick. So I'm going to say, okay. yes, he's the guy I said is going to be the MVP. So um, yeah, he should. I mean, look right now, Josh Allen, it's kind of hard not to, to think about him or even Stefan Diggs. Mm-hmm. Um you know, if you want to throw a defensive guy in there, you know, Von Miller, Micah Parsons, some of those guys. But Joe Burrow, uh, over the next two weeks, will be – because this isn't going to slow down. I mean, you're, you, he he should be in the mix. He should have never not been in the mix. Mm-hmm. You know, Patrick Mahomes is someone who's going to be in the mix because they're playing great football right now as well. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, Joe Joey B, man, he's he was my <laughs> pick, and I'm, and I'm sticking to it. You know what? I think Bengals fans are really going to like <laughs> the sound of that. They're they're all in on Joey B. And it's so funny because around you hear so many um, people speak about him because he's a hot topic. Always. Um, they talk about his cockiness. But so far, I have yet to see the cockiness. I just see more of a quiet confidence, if that makes sense. Yeah. You know, he's got and I hate the expression. He's got swag, though. I mean, yeah. you know how he walks in the games and you saw him in new Orleans, walk in the LSU Jersey. Like this is my place. Um, (laughs) It's, it's subtle. It's subtle, but it's just like, yeah, I'm the dude you saw in the locker room picture smoking a cigar at all times. And, and and so I think that's how come so many people like just really dig everything about him. You know, he, he stands up post game at the podium, you know, he doesn't love doing the media stuff. You could see that. Um, but he handles it very professionally. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's condescending in any way. Um, and I think he understands or is starting to understand his place as an elite player in this league. And, and I think that's something that he's going to continue to grow with as he continues to succeed. Yeah, he, he can always grow somewhere. And I think that might be an ass, an area where he could grow. And I think he is willing to do that. He seems like he is anyways. Um, and we talk about their trajectory for the season. I know Burrow said last week that these, including last week, uh, the three games before the bye are the most important in his eyes for the season's turnout. Um, and with their trajectory at the forefront of this question, how important is Monday night's game against the Browns? It's on the road and, you know, they still have yet to get a win in the division. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a huge part of things. You know, they're, they're, 
every game right now is important because again, you're chasing Buffalo, you're chasing Kansas City. Yeah. You see how good that AFC East is too, you know, with the Jets and mm-hmm. Dolphins right there too. So you can't you can't afford to take any chances knowing that the Ravens aren't going anywhere. Right. Um, and that a team like Cleveland can get hot, right? So you you, yeah. you don't want to give them any type of of life whatsoever. So if they go into Cleveland and they do what they should do, which is put a big number on them, to be honest, because Cleveland's having problems scoring, mm-hmm. um, their defense is allowing big plays, then that should be good. But, I mean, they've got to understand also, they've got, like I said earlier, they got a target on their back. Cleveland is coming for them. Um so they, they can't in any way ever take their foot off the gas or think that this is just a gimme because the Browns are struggling right now. Yeah, it seems like any opponent within the AFC North, you almost don't look at the record because they always play each other incredibly tough no matter what. And most of the time, both sides come away with significant injuries. Um, and you know that it just seems like Nick Chubb and Kareem yeah. Hunt will will work on that run game, especially knowing that DJ Reader is still not back for the Cincinnati Bengals on defense yet. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's what the Browns do. I mean, their passing game yeah. isn't – anything to speak of right now, but their run game is everything. And if they were to get away from it, then people are going to start asking more questions about <laughs> yeah. what Kevin Stefanski is doing up there. So look, Cleveland knew it was probably going to be a tough sledding without Deshaun Watson having to play this many games without him. I think they were hoping to be better. Mm-hmm. And, but you, we also have to know that, you know, the Bengals are wise enough to say the Browns are going to run the ball on us. So even though reader's yeah. not back, they're going to come up with some schemes to try to plug the middle, to try to plug things up front because they're probably not overly worried. I expect Von Bell to, to be playing a lot. I know he plays close to the line of scrimmage a lot, but to do what he does and to really help out in the run game, because he's going to be crucial because those running backs can hit it. They can make a guy miss and they're gone. Right. So the open field tackling is, is you know, that's where Jesse Bates comes in also because he's so good in the open field. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's going to have to be crisp. Because the Browns are not going to go down lightly. And, and you know, I'm sure the Bengals know that. Absolutely. The Browns have lost four in a row. And if they lose on Monday night, that would send them to two and six. And at that point, is it far-fetched to think that maybe some of their players would be on the trading chopping block? I know they would have a short turnaround with Tuesday, obviously, the next day. But is that something that is even in a conversation within the league? No, no. I mean, if, if their player is going to be moved, it'll be moved this week. Remember, the trade deadline is Monday. Yeah. Um, so I, I just don't know who – I mean, there are probably some players that the team want. You know, we've heard Kareem Hunt's name mentioned, but there's some other running backs out there. You saw, you know, the Jets, everyone thought Kareem Hunt was going to be in play there, and they went out and got Robinson, Brian Robinson from the Jaguars. Cam Akers is another running back for the Rams who's going to be made available. I just don't know if the, if, if the Browns – are going to be actively um, trading guys. Lord knows, you know, they've got – they need draft picks. They gave up, (laughs) you know, they gave up a generation's worth uh, to get to Sean Watson. So you would think maybe, but I just don't think they're giving up on their season yet. No, that makes total sense. Um, And back to the Bengals a little bit. Is it it far-fetched to think that – Maybe they will be playing um, late into January, maybe being that outlier and competing in a Super Bowl in back-to-back years. Um, I know there were a lot of downers uh, with their 0-2 start, but they've climbed right out of that, and they're back in the conversation, it seems like. Yeah, and people aren't – I don't think a lot of people are paying attention to how they've been playing lately. So, yeah, to answer your first question, yes. You know, Cincinnati should be there in the mix playing well into January. Again, right now, it's – when you look at the way the teams are playing in the AFC, I mean, no one's playing better than the Bills, Chiefs, and Bengals right now. Those are the three really strong teams in the AFC, even though the Dolphins, you know, with two are back, yeah. I think they're going to be back in the mix. The Jets are, are red hot right now. But the way the Bengals can score, like I said, I don't think they care what defense you play against them. I don't think they care – what your offensive strength is, they feel that they've got the players who are better than yours. And for the most part, they're right. So, yeah. yes, they're, they, I, I think they will be right there when push comes to shove if they stay healthy. Because like you just said, there, there are injuries mm-hmm. coming. 
you know, that's going to that's gonna derail some team, and some team we're not talking about is going to get hot. You know, Tennessee's playing well right now, so we, we can't, you know, all of a sudden right. discount them. They're, they're like the Bengals. They're in the shadows. Yeah. You know, they're in the Bengals and the Chiefs' shadows, and I'm sure, I'm sure they probably prefer it like that. But that's another team you need to keep your eye on. Yeah, I, I think that health is wealth, especially in this league, especially when you're playing 17 games. You've got to be healthy into the later stretch of the season. Um, and their defense, I know they have some key injuries right now, Cincinnati Bengals' defense does. Um, but the fact that they're still going on with this, this you know, train of being able to hold teams off in the second half, not allowing a single touchdown, the only team that's to do that amazing so far to this year. That is, that is the stat of the year. <laughs> really? I, I don't is. know. I mean, I don't know how that happens. Not allow a touchdown. And we're going into to week eight. Yeah. They have not allowed a touchdown in the second half of games. To me, that's one, Lou Anarumo, the D.C., mm-hmm changing and making adjustments on the fly in the second half and getting his guys in position. And now it's probably a sense of pride. I'm sure guys are talking about in the locker room, don't let him yeah. score a touchdown. You know, just like how they talk about don't, don't allow this guy to get 100 yards. Right. So that just goes to show you how they are buttoned up and they feel we're good. And now that they're playing with these leads, now they can dial it up. You know, hopefully Trey Henderson can come back from that stinger issue that he's got going on right now. Hopefully it's not too bad of a pinch nerve. Um, and he can continue to play healthy because he's he's just such a factor up front. They got so much pressure from the edges. Um, that will that will only help. But that to me, of what you just said, is the stat of the year. Yeah. I mean, when I heard it a couple of weeks ago, I was like, What? <laughs> is that crazy? Uh, you just might have seen my four-year-old pop in. She brought me some popcorn, and that is what a sweetheart. That is warranted when you when you talk about um, listening to you talk about this defense and how incredible this stat is. It, I know I know that every coach makes second half adjustments, but it seems like maybe it doesn't always land. Maybe it doesn't always translate. Um, something is landing with this with this team with what Lou Anarumo is what whatever message he's giving them is really connecting. Well, I mean a lot of it is the other team, you know, they've they've got players on scholarship too. You know, those those guys make plays. Yeah. But the fact that they're denying that, I mean again, it goes to the caliber of talent. You're seeing those safeties, you know, Bell and Jesse Bates just mm-hmm. clean up anything that may break down up front. Um it's the offense taking care of the ball and putting points on the board in the second half and putting other teams in predicaments they don't like to be in. But it's also a very simple situation of football. It is on first down, making sure that second down is second and six or more, right? So then you can do some things defensively. If it's second and three, then they kind of got you. They got downs to play around with. So keeping teams in unfavorable situations, which the Bengals – are doing right now. I mean, I, I'm looking at, you know, their third down percentage. They're, they're only allowing 36% yeah. on defense for the season. Wild. I mean, that, that factors into it. Right. You know, that, that's, that's a huge, huge thing, you know, but still it just seems like the, the, the law of averages would say someone's going to score a touchdown in the second yeah. half. By the end of the season, I'm sure somebody will. So the fact that they've been able to do this through seven games is remarkable and a true testament to, you know, the execution the, the, the coachability and, and the pride of the guys on that, on that defense. Absolutely. Yeah. They, they certainly, you can tell with this group that they have a lot of pride and they enjoy playing with each other. They play really fast. So it seems like Lou has simplified things for them to be able to play as, as fast as they do. Um, and I want to give you one more question. I know I want to be respectful of your time. Um, I promised Steve 15 to 20 minutes, so we're going to cut it off there, but um, I wanted to ask you about the Ravens. They're playing the Bucks Thursday night football. Um, who do you take and what is most intriguing about this game to you? Well, I'll start with the second part first. I mean, the most intriguing part is can the Bucks snap out of it? They are not playing good football on either side of the no. ball. I mean, we all thought this defense, you know, would carry this team knowing that they had issues on the offensive line, that Tom Brady was getting older and they've got injuries at wide receiver, but this defense has been getting gashed. Yeah. They did not, they, they, they just have not played well. Um, what the commanders of all teams were able to do to them was just doing the way they ran the ball. Some things that happened was, was stunning. 
you know, are they going to tighten it up? I mean, these are just simple things to tighten up that they're not executing. And can, can, and can Tom Brady get it going? I mean, it does look like Father Time is knocking on his door a little bit. Mm-hmm. And he's got, you know, Mike Evans, that, that drop the other day. I mean, guys just aren't making plays um, as well all the time. I think they've got the potential to. Um, I like the Ravens in this game. Something tells me that the Buccaneers are going to are, are going to show up. Okay. And if they do, is it a matter of the Ravens being able to, to play well in the fourth down or in the fourth quarter, I should say, which last week was like the, the first time <laughs> we really saw them do that. Yeah. Um, they've had trouble. Yeah. So I, I, I like the Ravens going in just because the Buccaneers are, are, are looking, I mean, they're just looking sloppy on both sides. They look yeah. flat. They look like they're uninspired, but maybe after that humbling that they took against Washington, they'll, they'll show up. I agree with you. I think that the Ravens have a little bit of an edge in this one, but I know Bengals fans would love to see the Ravens lose on Thursday night. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) big time. It's always, it seems like the last few years, it's been the Bengals and the Ravens going back and forth. Um, But Steve, thank you so much. Our good friend, our mutual friend, Laura Chapnick, I was telling her before Mm -hmm. this interview, I said, I do not get um, antsy or jittery before any, any interview. It's usually just business as usual. And she said, don't worry, Steve is smooth. He's awesome. And I said, it's it's not, you know, it's not nervousness. It's more excitement that he's going to just bring so much value to the table today. Um, and I thank you for your insight this afternoon. You're awesome. Well, I appreciate you having me on and you are raising your daughter right. And she was kind <laughs> enough to bring you a snack during the middle of your yes. show. There you go. <laughs> Making sure I'm fed the best. <laughs> thank you, Steve. Thank you. I think you've got to throw out all records when you talk about two AFC North teams facing off with each other. The Cincinnati Bengals are still looking for their first win within the division, and the Browns can be a dangerous team for sure. Four of their five losses were by three or less points. They've been in every single game that they have lost, so you cannot let up with a team like this. Also, Joe Burrow noted um, this afternoon that there is a 30% chance of rain. He is certainly paying attention to that. So Monday night should be a fantastic Halloween game. And if the Cincinnati Bengals can pull that off, they are in a great position at five and three. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week on the OT at eight o'clock.